Now, the one who protects us all from prattling prognosticators and perfidious pundits. I say, America, stay out the bushes. For the Union Navy. I will secure these rights. Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. From my cold, dead hands. It's time for the Alan Nathan Show. Here he is, the longest-running nationally syndicated centrist host in the country, Alan Nathan. Welcome aboard, everybody. Welcome aboard. I'm ever yours, Alan Nathan, the militant moderate. Thank you so much for joining us. If this is your virgin voyage, allow me to share with you our mantra. Folks, we want the Republicans out of our bedroom, the Democrats out of our wallets, and both out of our First and Second Amendment rights. We feel there exists this cavernous gap separating the two orthodoxies, and that it's a gap comprised of many degree-thinking people who can argue quite passionately in shades of gray. And to that end, each and every show, we have fine guests to help best illustrate this point. Today is no exception. Also, if you wish to hook up with us on the web, it's www.alannathan.com. Don't forget that email address, alan at alannathan.com. That's A-L-A-M. Coming at you live and strong each and every Monday through Friday this time. Don't forget the classic Alan Nathan show, Saturday, 6 to 7 p.m. And overnight Sunday mornings, 3 to 4, all times Eastern. We are indeed a Main Street Radio Network production. Please check us out at MainStreetRadioNetwork.com. Feel free to avail yourselves of our nascent but always robust Twitter and Facebook options that we have there for you. And, of course, with great dispatch and alacrity, we love to thank our distributor, the Salem Radio Network. That's right, the Alan Nathan Show entering its 16th year of national syndication. All thanks to you. Reaching about 800 towns and cities across a couple of hundred radio station broadcasts each week again. All thanks to you. And, by the way, I don't care if you're part of the authoritarian left or perpetually clueless right. Please get out of the thought control business. Our topics du jour. Will former IRS tax-exempt director Lois Lerner be criminally charged for politically targeting conservatives and misleading Congress? Democrats announced plans to intimidate the Supreme Court to impact future rulings. Is it time for the left to perhaps sample its own medicine? And former Obama Press Secretary Robert Gibbs says the Affordable Care Act's employer mandate, quote, will be one of the first things to go, unquote. Is he correct? Joining us, old friend of the program, Robert Weiner, Democratic strategist, columnist, and former communications director for Clinton Drug Czar General Barry McCaffrey. By the way, he's also former communications director for Congressman Rangel and Conyers of New York and Michigan, respectively. Bob, good to have you back. It's a pleasure, Alan, and thanks for having me on. No, good to have you. Good to have you. Listen, the Hill newspapers reporting, uh, we touched on this in the previous hour, quote, Senate Democrats and liberal groups are mounting a pressure campaign against the Supreme Court hoping to influence future decisions by blasting conservative justices for alleged political bias. So a bias is on those occasions when rulings don't go their way. Got it. Now, they're apparently going to portray the court as a tool of the rich. But given that this is the same court that saved Obamacare by categorizing it as a tax, again, the very thing Obama and Democrats had said it was not. But again, since the court did save this dysfunctional law, which harms companies and, if anything, works against the grain of the supposed wealthy throughout the country, how are they going to pull this off as an argument? Also, if they get to intimidate the court, do I get to intimidate Democratic leaders by giving out their private cell phones and addresses to my listening audience? Seems fair to me, yes? Well, first of all, Alan, it's not intimidation to influence the Supreme Court. It's democracy. And you remember that Ken Starr went out against me because supposedly I was intimidating uh, uh, prosecutors, his prosecutors, uh, when he subpoenaed my wife and me for making private phone calls from our house uh, commending people uh, against the uh, Linda Tripp uh, taping. And he subpoenaed me, uh, and yet the Tripp taping was illegal. The Maryland legislature had 50 members of the legislature that said it's illegal because it's a one-party uh, uh, wiretapping in a two-party consent state. So my my wife and I were subpoenaed by Ken Starr. We went out in the courthouse steps. We said this is Big Brother at its worst, and uh, we got interviewed on Today, Good Morning America, and we were the lead on Brokaw and Jennings, and, uh, and Ken Starr fell in the, in the polls. You remember that the New York Times said I was the first uh, uh, Starr victim to go out and actually chastise him for overreach. If you uh, try to speak your mind against a court that goes too far, that's democracy. So that's point one against your point. Second of all, this is a rich court when they vote Citizens United and the other case, and they are putting money back into politics. These are rich guys who've contributed. The record shows it. Look at Clarence Thomas's records and others. They've contributed to, uh, to political campaigns. That's inappropriate for Supreme Court members. 
if it were inappropriate, it wouldn't be legally permissible, but it is. So we're No, the Supreme that. Court trumps the regular court's rules. Regular courts, it's not legal to be involved. Supreme Court is supreme. They can do what they want. It's not illegal for them. Well, I want to get to the specifics of this because there seems to be a huge flaw in your argument. Now, when we look at the ruling, a, a citizen, for instance, used to be able to donate 5200 to every House and Senate candidate, but only until uh, he reached the limit of 48600 After the ruling got rid of that limit, assuming someone wanted to give 5200 to everyone running in one party, the new total would come to over $2 million in a regular two-year cycle. Uh, why is it that donations aren't um, corrupting government when it gives, when it allows somebody to give to eight to nine people, but it is corrupting government when that individual can give to 14, 15, or 23 people. I mean, at what point is it, does it go from um, responsible uh, citizen participation in politics to buying votes? From the Koch brothers on the right to Soros on the left, money in politics is the most corrupt, and we call it campaign contributions, but the most corrupt force that we have that is one of the reasons why we have a such an income disparity. It's why we are taking away five trillion dollars. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Income disparity. Like there's no. You're not tethering that to any standard. First of all, if you're against income disparity or you're against income inequality, by default that means you're against better pay for better skills. Because at one point or another, you're going to have differences in remuneration because you, as opposed to the person next to you, may have more or less in the way of a, of a resume, of skills, of education, of a proven track record for tenacity. So if you're against income inequality, all that means is that you're against capitalism. You're against better pay for better skills. I mean, you might as well go back to the old Soviet Union, you know, from each according to his uh, ability to each according to his need. The fact of fundraising in campaigns is why we have tax breaks for the oil, big tax breaks for the oil and, and, and subsidies for the oil companies and big pharma, but they're trying to, uh, to make uh, poor people pay more for Medicare, go to vouchers. It's one of the reasons why we have some of the worst things that we have in politics, taking away the rights of people to, uh, to, to a lot of the things that are basic needs. It's one of the reasons why our college education has depleted, Alan, and, and students are paying more and more. And there more. is and not the, the again, there's, there's no correlative relevance now. to your, to, uh, you know, linking your response to my question posed. Absolutely. You if you're going, if you are against if you are against income inequality, by default, that means you're against better pay for better skills. You try to rationalize it after the fact, but when your party goes out there and preaches against income inequality, they don't give it with the caveats you do, the qualifiers you do. They just, in a generic form, want to characterize those who are making a good living as somehow uh, being wrongful and, and somehow being damaging to those who aren't making as much money. And doing so, I believe, is uh, very reminiscent of what was borrow. pulled off in the borrow. 2012 election when you guys endeavored to demonize capitalism against Mitt Romney. I don't quarrel whatsoever with the right of people to make money for proper and good and effective and capable work. But when this gal from GM gets up there and can't answer a damn thing about uh, uh, with car safety, and, uh, and when you have oil companies who have no, no response as to why they should get big subsidies when they're making humongous profits, and then you have the kind of slashes that Paul Ryan wants to make in the budget against poor people and middle-income people. That makes no sense to me. Well, yeah, but what is worse, that or B, your party defending overspending by pointing to those who would be harmed should that overspending stop. When you do that, you're essentially using the consequences for overspending as the grounds for never stopping What's it. What's overspending? What are we overspending on? You're overspending when, when things I mentioned. 17 trillion over budget means you're overspending. I don't need to enumerate them Good. all. So That's the final total. The, the oil companies and the big pharma tax breaks, and let's uh, actually do something. What about the what government accounting offices report each and every year showing that we are misplacing three hundred and fifty billion dollars a year through redundant spending? I mean, you put that at a ten-year trajectory. That's three and a half trillion. We've been getting our nineties in a knot. Uh, our jock straps all tied up, our bra straps all gnarled up over a lousy $1.2 trillion in sequestration over 10 years as if it was the end of the universe. But when we've got $3.5 trillion sitting right there on the table over the next 10 years that we wouldn't even miss, the Government Accounting Office points this out, redundant programs are the least defensible ones. That means that you could essentially 
suspend those programs, hurt nobody because they're redundant, take that wasted cash and use that as a buttress before even getting into the argument of whether or not we uh, cut spending or increase taxes. Now, don't get me wrong. Well, you're, you're I right do believe that. that there is greater debt reduction potential through the cutting of spending than there is the raising of taxes because you could tax the wealthy 100 percent and you're not going to put a dent in the in, in our indebtedness. But well, having said that, what's wrong with going after the three and a half trillion that the GAO provides for us over 10 years? Why not do that before getting into these other arguments? Well, I, I don't disagree. When uh, in 1995, we put a report out when I was spokesman for the House Government Operations Committee of $500 billion and the same 22 agencies overlapping. Alan, this is a, a flaw of both parties, and it's gone on forever, so we can agree on that. On that, we do concur, but there is zero reason why that shouldn't be the first order of discussion. And any time I hear a Democrat or Republican not going to that first, I know I'm talking to somebody with their head up their rectum. You're listening to The Alan Nathan Show. Stick with us. Thanks, Bob. This report brought to you by Microsoft. According to an IDC study, businesses worldwide will spend nearly $500 billion this year to address problems caused by malware on pirated software. Globally, consumers are expected to spend $25 billion and waste 1.2 billion hours because of security threats and costly computer fixes. Consumers and businesses in the U.S. are key targets for cybercrime. The good news is Microsoft is taking action to protect its customers, partners, and intellectual property. Microsoft Corporation's Mark Lamb. At Microsoft, we are committed to protecting unsuspecting consumers from becoming victims of software piracy and malware, which can lead to identity theft, loss of data, and system failures. Consumers can learn more about piracy risks and malware by visiting Microsoft.com slash piracy. Here, Microsoft provides guidance and tools to protect from risks associated with piracy and report instances of pirated software. For more, visit Microsoft.com slash piracy. Despite the availability of medications to treat advanced prostate cancer, the majority of men are not being cured of the disease, and new and better treatment options are still needed. The Affinity Clinical Trial is examining a new investigational drug used along with chemotherapy in men with advanced prostate cancer. The investigational medicine may help existing treatments more effectively fight the cancer. If you have advanced prostate cancer, talk with your doctor to see if a clinical trial might be right for you. To learn more about the Affinity Trial, visit ProstateCancerStudy.com or call 877-STUDY-15 to speak with a clinical trial specialist. By participating in a clinical trial, you can help shape the future of cancer treatment. For more information on the Affinity Clinical Trial, visit ProstateCancerStudy.com or call 877-STUDY-15. This report brought to you by Oncogenics Pharmaceuticals, Inc. I'm Paul Johnson. Perhaps most frustrating to those of us who love independence is an authoritarian government that would impose limits on everyone but itself. The National Center for Public Policy Research understands this and exposes unrestrained EPA regulators who fabricate environmental grounds in order to exceed statutory authority that ravages our freedom to produce. It fights a president who violates the Constitution by making recess appointments while Congress is unambiguously still in session. And it challenges leaders who would usurp our Second Amendment rights to bear arms by opportunity opportunistically using tragedy as a tactic to remove that protection. In short, Americans are very wary of a government that manufactures grounds to transcend the authority of the very Constitution to which it is otherwise subordinate. Help the National Center for Public Policy Research remind politicians of who's in charge, just as did James Madison, the father of the Constitution, when he said that, quote, the censorial power is in the people over the government and not in the government over the people. Visit nationalcenter.org. Again, that's nationalcenter.org. Hi, it's Practical Polly's radio show. If you're just figuring out that healthier cooking oils are better than solid fats, you may be asking, now what am I going to do with all these tubs of lard? Ever had one of those moments when your favorite skinny jeans feel too tightly tailored? <laughs> Generously apply lard to your hips and thighs and those fancy pants will slide on like a dream. Or here's a family-friendly idea. How about making your yard into a lard fun park? Frost your driveway with a nice thick coating and give those kiddos a downhill thrill no matter what time of year. Having a bad hair day? Yep. A little lump of lard can tame your flyaways in a jiffy. So there's no need for that lard to go to waste or to your waste. 
but get your best heart-healthy trade-up with healthier oils, like canola, olive, or other vegetable oils, which can actually lower your chances for heart disease. Now that's a tip worth keeping for life. Learn more at heart.org slash face the fats. Canola Info is the national supporter of the American Heart Association's Face the Fats campaign. things that I want to say about the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Robert gives his opinion. I don't know who his clients are or what his perspective is. And you think it's integral. You think the employer mandate is integral and yes. will and has to stay. Yeah, and, and it, this is a, a, a an initiative that has strong pillars in it that relate to each other. But to, to put a period on it, you cannot see supporting anything that would remove the business mandate. No, no, no. I mean, the, I don't know why we're focusing on that. One person says one thing. Former White House Press Secretary Robert Gibbs predicted in a speech yesterday at a health benefits expo that the twice-delayed mandate requiring employers to either offer full-time workers insurance or pay penalties will be repealed altogether. Gibbs declaring to what was described as a surprised audience, quote, I don't think the employer mandate will go into effect. It's a small part of the law. I think it will be one of the first things to go. President Obama was on defense today over health care, but not from Republicans. Friendly fire from a former press secretary, forcing the current man at the podium to insist there will be no further delays to the employer mandate. That's correct. The final rules were put out in February, uh, and this will be phased in starting next year in accordance with the final rules. Of course, the president's aides have repeatedly downplayed potential changes to the law, only to tweak it more than two dozen times. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. This is just as bemusing as, as you could imagine. And it's just so bizarre. I mean, where are we now? Given the spectacular failure of Obamacare on so many damn levels, where the hell are we? I mean, the examples seem endless. Obama lying over whether or not you could keep your doctor and health plan if you liked, period, or the administration lying about the average family saving 2500 a year on health care, or later with the administration lying that the only ones not covered by his health care promise were those with individual insurance, when also not covered by that promise were and are 90 million people with employer-based insurance. And the only reason why we haven't been hearing those folks uh, you know, giving this White House a good thronging, as Chaucer may have put, and I can't say what that really means over the year in modern English because I would be kicked off <laughs> by the FCC. But the only reason why you're not hearing these complaints is because this, in, this um, employer mandate has been twice delayed, which means the consequences of that, that mandate's existence are not being realized. So it's not as if anything has been successfully changed. There's nothing having to do with long-term permanence uh, as it relates to this law. No, it's been suspended a couple of times by executive order, which has no long-term permanence because once this president's out of office, his successor can immediately toss out whatever the hell he's done. So that means that we'll see nothing but a bunch of Band-Aids being uh, thrown in the rubbish bin and all the sores, all the pus that will be coming oozing forth from this wound that was inflicted on us in 09 um, will be undeniably in front of us because why? The delay will no longer be there. And that's all this president has done. He hasn't fixed the offending component of the law. He has merely delayed it long enough so as to dodge political accountability for that law. Anyway, uh, again, every year is Alan Nathan, the militant moderate. Once again, this is the oasis for those who have an aversion to the left, right, black, white, two-dimensional approach. And first, you were listening to Nancy Pelosi with CNN's Candy Crowley, very upset with Robert Gibbs and, and what he had to say that, the, you know, the employer mandate would be the first thing to go. She just cannot stand dissent, uh, whether it's from the other side of the aisle or from her own ranks, because Robert Gibbs, of course, is a former Obama uh, press secretary. Also, you then hear Ed Henry, White House correspondent for Fox News, formerly of CNN, reporting about the Gibbs statement uh, saying that he thinks the employer mandate is a small part of the law and will be gone. Uh, Pelosi thinks it's integral, but we've already come to understand uh, that, that she essentially is, sadly enough, uh, approaching senility. This is the same idiot who told us that in order for us to really understand the law, we'd first have to let it uh, get passed. We'd have, to let it, we'd have to let it pass in order to know what was inside it. What a schmuck. 
And then, of course, Ed Henry again talking to White House Press Secretary Jay Carney, bringing up that same uh, observation by Robert Gibbs and Carney promising no new changes, no new changes. But again, you have to remember, they had promised no new changes long before other changes were subsequently rendered. So uh, take their... uh, uh, alleged veracity with a grain of salt it deserves. We have assisting me in the opining, one of my regulars, Peter Roth, contributing editor at U.S. News and World Report. He's also a former senior political writer for United Press International and is currently a senior fellow at the Frontiers of Freedom. Peter, good to have you back, buddy. How are you? Thank you, Alan. Good to be here. Good to have you. Good to have you. Uh, what do you think about what Gibbs had to say? Was this just an un- uncharacteristic uh, bout with honesty and veracity? Um, or uh, is he perhaps doing so as, uh, you know, a way for other Democrats to eventually pivot away from this law with some kind of cover, although I don't know how much cover a former press secretary can really offer. What's your take on this? A trial balloon the size of a Goodyear blimp. (laughs) Remember, Gibbs was in the White House when all of this was being planned and all of this was being negotiated out. Mm Mm-hmm. What they were going to be for, what they could keep, what they could get rid of, what had to, what they abs- had to have, what they'd like to have, what was a non-starter. So Gibbs knows, Gibbs knows the inside thinking of the president, probably the leaders on Capitol Hill, that the employer mandate, not necessary, it can go, which is going to put the Democrats in a very interesting position of having released employers from the mandate, but not workers. Because remember that in contemporary American politics, Republicans are supposed to be the party of the boss. And Democrats are supposed to be the party of the workers. And it's working in reverse right now if we look at the results. But, you know, that was the dynamic in place during the 2012, and it didn't seem to work very well from Mitt Romney. Well, that's because Mitt Romney was running around proclaiming himself the candidate not of working Americans but of entrepreneurs and employers. The subtle distinction, but it's one that wasn't lost on what we used to be called, for example, Reagan Democrats. Yeah. You know, Mitt Romney's out there defending your boss, not you. And the two aren't mutually they, exclusive they, they, because they, they, if you defend a boss, that means you're defending the job creator who can always ensure that the worker bee has a place uh, to to perform his, indus, his, uh, his industry and to make money from it. Um, I don't know why these always have to be put at odds. And I say this is well, a small the, businessman. The, the Democrats, the Democrats – you know, taking a page from Marx and Engels, organize everything according to class warfare, and that employers and employees are necessarily at odds from one another, and their interests, in fact, don't intersect. Uh, this is what the this is what the modern Democrat, you know, post Franklin Roosevelt Democratic Party is built on. Well, you know, the funny and, thing is, I'm okay with collective bargaining at the private level, private unions, because sure. you've got a you got a check and balance there. You've got a negotiator representing uh, the interests of the unions. And you've got a negotiator representing the interest of the company. You know, you've got, you've got a, a board member or whatever re- representing uh, their interest. But public unions, I don't think, can really work that way properly because well, that, while you still have the same thing. dynamic, while you still have that same dynamic with the uh, unions, you know, a negotiator representing the interest of his, his or her respective members. On the other side, the politician who's supposed to represent the taxpayer's interests resist on their behalf. Uh, actually finds greater political reward through caving in. So you have this inherently developing conflict of interest. And I guess that's the reason why we have all these public unions costing so many state municipalities across the country the millions of dollars that that, that it has, leading some to have to enter into bankruptcy. Or am I overstating it? No, you're not overstating it at all. I didn't mean to run right into the music. My apologies. Peter's going to be with us on the other side of the break. We'd love you to stick around as well. You're listening to The Alan Nathan Show right here on the Main Street Radio Network. Going to be right back. bring a number of wonderful benefits into our lives. But unpleasant litter box odor isn't one of them. According to a new study, 55% of cat owners have avoided or considered not inviting guests over because of the way their home smelled. And more than one in three cat owners say litter box odors are more embarrassing for guests to notice than a clogged toilet. Fortunately, cat owners no longer have to be worried by lingering odors ruining their home's ambiance. New Arm & Hammer Clump & Seal Cat Litter offers cat owners a seven-day 
odor-free home guaranteed. Only Clump and Seal Cat Litter has breakthrough technology that forms a tight seal around odor and destroys it with powerful odor eliminators and Arm & Hammer baking soda. Plus, it offers low tracking, ultra-low dust, and a soft feel that your cat will love. Arm & Hammer Clump and Seal is available in a variety of sizes at retail outlets nationally. Experience the confidence of an odor-free home for seven days. For more information and to hear what other cat owners are saying, visit clumpandseal.com. Need help with your to-do list? Looking to freshen up your home and add some spice to an old recipe? Professional chef Martita Hara shares why the Homemade Simple TV series on OWN should become part of your Saturday morning routine. Watch Homemade Simple for quick and easy solutions to help you create a home that's clean, fresh, and completely your own. See quick, clever projects and handy tips you love come to life only on OWN. Join me and host Soleil Moonfry as we show deserving families and hardworking friends how to simplify their homes and lives. We provide new quick recipes, smart storage solutions, money-saving decorating ideas, and creative entertaining tips each week. Simply watch the Homemade Simple TV series every Saturday at 9 a.m. Eastern and 8 a.m. Central on OWN or visit HomemadeSimpleTV.com. Stock car racing crew chief Kevin Bonomanion has been involved with racing almost his whole life. It's a demanding sport with a long season that keeps him on the go. And for the last 10 years, he's had to balance his career with living with gout, a serious form of arthritis. As a crew chief, I have felt the pain of gout flares on and off the track. I want to help inform people like me that gout has an underlying cause that may be managed by working with your doctor. I'm partnering with Takeda Pharmaceuticals to help raise awareness about gout. A gout flare is a sign of gout and can happen without warning. Gout is caused by a buildup of uric acid. If you have gout, high uric acid can form crystals in your joints, which may lead to painful gout attacks. According to experts, a goal in the treatment of gout is to reduce the uric acid level in the blood to a healthy level, which is below 6 milligrams per deciliter. Gout may be managed through diet and lifestyle changes, along with medications if needed to target healthy uric acid levels. Even with a busy race schedule, I make time to have meaningful conversations with my doctor about my gout. I tell him if I have any flares and ask about my uric acid level. I work with my doctor on a management plan that includes diet, exercise, and taking my prescription medicine, Uloric, to help lower my uric acid level. Every person is different. Talk to your doctor about treatment options that may be right for you. Use of Uloric Fibuxostat. Uloric is a prescription medicine used to lower blood uric acid levels in adults with gout. Uloric is not for the treatment of high uric acid without a history of gout. Individual results may vary. Important safety information for Uloric. Do not take Uloric if you are taking azathioprine or mecaptopurine. Your gout may flare up when you start taking Uloric. Do not stop taking your Uloric even if you have a flare. Your health care provider may give you other medicines to help prevent your gout flares. A small number of heart attacks, strokes, and heart-related deaths were seen in clinical studies. It is not certain that Uloric caused these events. Tell your health care professional about liver or kidney problems or a history of heart disease or stroke. Your health care professional may do blood tests to check your liver function while you are taking Uloric. The most common side effects of Uloric are liver problems, nausea, gout flares, joint pain, and rash. For further information on Uloric, talk to your healthcare professional and see complete prescribing information by visiting www.uloric.com or by calling 1-877-Uloric-6. For more on gout and prescription treatment options, visit goutsmart.com. I'm Rick Osick, Brown Shoe Company Division President of Famous Footwear. We're proud to support the March of Dimes by walking in March for Babies. It's a great feeling to know the money we raise supports life-saving research and programs that improve the health of babies. And with your help, we can make this year better than ever. Join Famous Footwear and our employees across the country and help more moms have full-term pregnancies and healthier babies. Start your team today at marchforbabies.org and march to help babies. Lois Lerner facing contempt charges this week in addition to a push to have the DOJ start a criminal case against her for what? Uh, misleading the Congress. You know, when this story first broke, someone asked me the question, well, who should be fired? I said, well, I don't care who's going to be fired. I want to know who's going to jail. And the fact is, is that uh, the IRS, there are specific laws 
uh, that protect taxpayers and force the IRS to comply with the law. Somebody at the IRS violated the law. Mm -hmm. Whether it was Lois Lerner or not, we'll find out. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Ways and Means Committee uh, and the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, both committees have jurisdiction over this IRS investigation. They've been wor both working together. The Ways and Means Committee will go into executive session on Wednesday. Uh, where they will go over this letter that they have put together, outline names of taxpayers uh, who've been harmed and aggrieved, uh, and lay out a case for how a mislearner misled the committee. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Every year is Alan Nathan, the militant moderate. Once again, this is the oasis for those who have an aversion to the left, right, black, white, two-dimensional approach. And you were listening to an exchange between Fox News' uh, Megyn Kelly with uh, Speaker John Boehner about what's going to happen with Lois Lerner. Uh, Boehner says he wants to know who's actually going to jail versus who's getting fired. Now, Lois Lerner, again, everybody, uh, this is the former IRS director for tax-exempt organizations. Uh, she's been at the heart of this scandal since last year when the agency, the IRS agency, was exposed for politically targeting conservative groups. And she had, you know, once again claimed Fifth Amendment protection against self-incrimination last month. The first time was uh, in May of last year, I believe. Now, unfortunately for Ms. Lerner, she's about to face multiple charges, including misleading an investigation, releasing private taxpayer information, as you heard Mr. Boehner reference, and also contempt of Congress for failing to comply with multiple uh, subpoenas. Um, we have a sister, me in the opining old friend of the show, one of my regulars, Peter Roth, contributing editor at U.S. News and World Report. He's also a former senior political writer for United Press International and is currently a senior fellow at the Frontiers of Freedom. Peter, always a blast. Peter, you there with us, buddy? All right, we're looking for Peter uh, right now. Uh, but Peter Roth will be joining us. But my, my point is that given the size and scale of the IRS's political abuse of Americans, and Lois Lerner's uh, alleged role in it, you got to wonder why this didn't happen a long time ago. But even though it is happening, is it just going to be for show? Or will we find that when the charges are brought to the Department of Justice, um, we will see firsthand how this DOJ will only hold criminals accountable if they happen to be criminals from the other side of the aisle? Uh, uh, Peter, Peter, you with us, buddy? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, good to have you, pal. Good to have you. I, I'm sorry. I, 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 I mysteriously teleported to the to the kitchenette of the Malaysian airplane, uh, <laughs> which, which apparently went through a wormhole and is into the future and is landing tomorrow at the airport in Beijing. But now I'm back. <laughs> but now you're back. Well, glad you were able to get through the gauntlet of metaphysical challenges uh, to return to us safe and sound. Um, oh, we had, oh, we, it's tough to be me. <laughs> we had just played a clip. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to hear any of it with uh, John Boehner, but essentially he was with uh, talking with Ms. Kelly, uh, Megan Kelly of Fox News. And he's talking about how Lois Lerner is going to be brought up on charges. Well, that is if the vote goes uh, the GOP's way. Um, she might be facing multiple charges, including misleading an investigation, releasing private taxpayer information, contempt of Congress for failing to comply with multiple subpoenas. And I'm thinking two things. One, given the size and scale of the abuse to which all of us uh, in this country could be potentially subjected if the IRS is allowed to continue doing what it's already done, uh, that is to say politically targeting folks who uh, perhaps have a, a perspective not to um, the Democrats' liking, I'm, I'm surprised that we didn't see Boehner do this a long time ago. But all that notwithstanding, isn't it very conceivable that even if the House votes to bring forward these charges, they've got to send the paperwork to the DOJ, and this DOJ, this Department of Justice, uh, under the uh, not-so-tender auspices of uh, Eric Holder, the Attorney General, has already demonstrated a long-standing proclivity for only holding people accountable for violating laws if they come from the other side of the aisle, not his own. Do you see that being replicated this go-around? Actually, I think, I'm not sure if the House refers to the Justice Department or to the U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia. But either way, Lois Lerner's got less to worry about than Susan McDougal. And if you'll remember, Susan McDougal spent, what, two and a half years in an orange jumpsuit because she wouldn't talk? Um, Lois Lerner is probably not even going to get a slap on the wrist because the Obama guys are all sitting around going, what are you going to do? Gonna, they, they don't care about this. So apparently you, you're the opinion. Republicans care about ethics and propriety and cooperating and rule of law, which is why Scooter Libby got his sentence commuted but didn't get a pardon. Democrats, meh, and justifies the means. 
So you think he's going to decide only to uphold laws that are violated by Republican suspects versus Democratic ones? No, I think he's going to decide only to prosecute violations of the law by Republicans. No, I think that's contrast a little sure difference, that, but I, I, I see well, what you're saying. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that, that, you uphold, that, that, that upholding the law here is the issue. It's, it's prosecution. Yeah, but by not by not understanding by not that... prosecuting and not upholding the law, but I think there's I think there's more okay. involved. Okay, okay. Now Boehner about... Boehner he, says you know he's out of here in six months and Obama's gone in two years and what is anybody going to do? Well, who's out in six months? Boehner, Holder. Oh, Holder is yeah, yeah. That's right. I was about to say Boehner. Anyway, I just heard Boehner's going to be. He's been told he can stick around a little while longer. We don't have much time, but anyway, now Boehner's saying that he's uh, not just interested in folks being fired; he wants them jailed. But given the gravity of an IRS agency caught red-handed politically targeting conservatives, Peter, are you surprised that he hasn't yet called for a select committee to investigate this? What's wrong with Boehner? I ask this because about, you know, 180, 190 some odd Republican congressmen think he should do just that. What's your read on this? Well, they, they, because they've cut the budget to save money in the House, they don't necessarily have money for a select committee. And, and honestly, other than headlines and something to talk about. I don't know that a select committee, even one with subpoena power, gets you any answers any faster than a normal standing committee of Congress does, particularly given the level of perfidy and stonewalling that comes out of Holder's Justice Department and Obama's White House. It's nice theater. I don't know that it actually gets you anything. Are you telling me there's no way to seek redress in a court of law for Congress to compel the Department of Justice to keep everyone equal under the law and not selectively target some for punishment while releasing others from punishment? I mean, because that seems to be the end result, or am I overstating it? I, I, think, I think the court would decide that that's a political calculation best left to the voters. It's a political calculation when somebody in the IRS has been caught red-handed politically targeting citizens. Well, and no, no, you're, asking, you're, asking, you're asking me two different things here. And what I heard you asking me is, is the question about whether or not Eric Holder decides he's, the law is going to apply to some people but not to other people using a partisan differentiation. And I think the court would decide that ultimately that's a political matter for the people to decide. And you're telling me the court by, by wouldn't whether or not find... they want to hire or fire um, Obama's uh, holder's boss. Now, the House. So wait, 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 wait. I got to stop you here. Can... You're telling me essentially that a court might find that it's okay for politics to trump the law. I don't know that a court would say it quite that way. Although that would be the effect. I think that they would they would come down on the side that this is essentially a political dispute between two branches of government that the courts don't necessarily have the right upon which to intervene. Why do you think now, Boehner is... Proper, i got to ask you this. The proper response here, in my mind, yeah. is if they really think that Holder is total is, and, and is failing to uphold his oath of office by prosecuting felonies, investigating and prosecuting felonies with equal zeal at the request of Congress, is for Congress to seek to remove him. By filing articles, by by filing articles of impeachment, which is a political calculation. Which is a political I calculation, yeah. That, a political calculation is a step I don't think Boehner wants to take, but I think that's what the redress is. You know, we we held hearings. Well, a simple he majority in the step. House, a simple he majority in the House, a simple majority in the House would impeach him, but it's a pyrrhic victory because uh, it, it's sort of like the it, it, it's like when uh, the grand jury hands down an indictment, that's fine, but then it still has to go into the court, and in this the case, court, the court would be the Senate. In this case, yep. the court would be the Senate. So and, let me ask you something. Harry Reid would never find time to bring it up. Why is Boehner, in your estimation, being such a schmuck about getting a select committee with actual teeth as opposed to the dentures we're currently seeing in use? I don't think he's being a schmuck. You don't think, think he's, he's being a schmuck by not having a go to a select committee? No, as I said. You do see how ineffectual these committees have been thus far, right? I, 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 a select committee would, in my mind, be no more effective than the committees of committee. 
You know, I guess what the reason I'm compelled to think this way is because I think it would be one thing if a multitude of committee members, let's say, pooled their more probative questions under the umbrella of perhaps a few members. That way, witnesses would be less able to wriggle free from a comparatively more penetrating and layered inquiry. Uh, but they don't do that. So absent that approach and innovative thinking, I'm thinking the select committee would be the only viable alternative to get to that kind of ability to be more probative. Anyway, never enough time. Peter Roth, always a blast. Folks, you're listening to The Alan Nathan Show. Going to be right back. The April 15th tax deadline is just days away, but there is still time to open and contribute to an individual retirement account or IRA, a contribution that may help reduce current and future federal income taxes. Ken Hevert is a vice president at Fidelity Investments. Saving enough to live comfortably in retirement continues to be a top concern among Americans, and taking steps to save a little more each year can make a big difference in the years to come. To do so, many are embracing the tax advantage benefits of Roth and traditional IRAs. In fact, we've seen a consistent increase in contributions made to Fidelity IRA accounts over the past five years. By contributing consistently to both workplace savings plans and IRAs, and directing those dollars to investment options appropriate to their age and individual needs, investors can take more control in reaching their financial goals. For more information about IRAs, including what type of IRA may be right for you, visit fidelity.com slash IRA. Keep in mind that investing involves risk, including the risk of loss. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC, SIPC. Perhaps most frustrating to those of us who love independence is an authoritarian government that would impose limits on everyone but itself. The National Center for Public Policy Research understands this and exposes unrestrained EPA regulators who fabricate environmental grounds in order to exceed statutory authority that ravages our freedom to produce. It fights a president who violates the Constitution by making recess appointments while Congress is unambiguously still in session. And it challenges leaders who would usurp our Second Amendment rights to bear arms by opportunity opportunistically using tragedy as a tactic to remove that protection. In short, Americans are very wary of a government that manufactures grounds to transcend the authority of the very Constitution to which it is otherwise subordinate. Help the National Center for Public Policy Research remind politicians of who's in charge, just as did James Madison, the father of the Constitution, when he said that, quote, the censorial power is in the people over the government and not in the government over the people. Visit nationalcenter.org. Again, that's nationalcenter.org. Despite the availability of medications to treat advanced prostate cancer, the majority of men are not being cured of the disease, and new and better treatment options are still needed. The Affinity Clinical Trial is examining a new investigational drug used along with chemotherapy in men with advanced prostate cancer. The investigational medicine may help existing treatments more effectively fight the cancer. If you have advanced prostate cancer, talk with your doctor to see if a clinical trial might be right for you. To learn more about the Affinity Trial, visit ProstateCancerStudy.com or call 877-STUDY-15 to speak with a clinical trial specialist. By participating in a clinical trial, you can help shape the future of cancer treatment. For more information on the Affinity Clinical Trial, visit ProstateCancerStudy.com or call 877-STUDY-15. This report brought to you by Oncogenics Pharmaceuticals, Inc. I'm Paul Johnson. Hi, it's Practical Polly's radio show. If you're just figuring out that healthier cooking oils are better than solid fats, you may be asking, now what am I going to do with all these tubs of lard? Ever had one of those moments when your favorite skinny jeans feel too tightly tailored? (laughs) Generously apply lard to your hips and thighs and those fancy pants will slide on like a dream. Or here's a family-friendly idea. How about making your yard into a lard fun park? Frost your driveway with a nice thick coating and give those kiddos a downhill thrill no matter what time of year. Having a bad hair day? Yep, a little lump of lard can tame your flyaways in a jiffy. So there's no need for that lard to go to waste or to your waste. But get your best heart-healthy trade-up with healthier oils, like canola, olive, or other vegetable oils, which can actually lower your chances for heart disease. Now that's a tip worth keeping for life. Learn more at heart.org slash face the fats. Canola Info is the national supporter of the American Heart Association's Face the Fats campaign. Need help with your to-do list? Looking to freshen up your home and add some spice to an old recipe? Professional chef Martita Hara shares why the Homemade Simple TV series on OWN should become part of your Saturday morning routine. 
Watch Homemade Simple for quick and easy solutions to help you create a home that's clean, fresh, and completely your own. See quick, clever projects and handy tips you love come to life only on OWN. Join me and Hostelay Moonfry as we show deserving families and hardworking friends how to simplify their homes and lives. We provide new quick recipes, smart storage solutions, money-saving decorating ideas, and creative entertaining tips each week. Simply watch the Homemade Simple TV series every Saturday at 9 a.m. Eastern and 8 a.m. Central on OWN or visit HomemadeSimpleTV.com. Let me just say something. People are going to have a choice as to whether they want to pay a certain amount for a selective network or pay more for a broader network. Which will mean your premiums get, will probably go up. They get that choice. That's a choice Which we always Which means your premium pay. may go up over what you were paying so that, in other words... He, it, no it, one it, guaranteed you that your premium wouldn't increase. We will start by reducing premiums by as much as $2,500 per family. Here's what Change is saying to people who already have health insurance and the employers who are providing it will work to lower your premiums by up to $2,500 per family per year. I also have a health care plan that would save the average family $2,500 on their premiums. And if you already have health Thank you, Derek. Thank you. Thank you. I was just, I couldn't help it. It's, it's one of my favorite ones. I mean, folks, I mean, this administration can be exposed over and over and over again for the lying that it commits, I mean, with their own words. And what they don't realize is they don't get to redraw standard lines already failed. What are standards for politicians? They are, I mean, people will say, what are you kidding? What standards do they have? Fine. But, but, but all that notwithstanding, the standards are the pledges they made, the promises they made, the projections they made. And when they're wrong, what they often like to do is untether themselves from the original standard on which they had predicated their promise as a way to somehow render noncompliance as compliance or falsehood as truth or failure as success. This is what they do. You just heard Ezekiel Manuel on the Fox News Channel some months ago uh, talking with Chris Wallace. And Ezekiel Manuel is the primary Obamacare architect. And he was looking at Chris Wallace with a straight face saying nobody ever promised anybody that the premiums would go down. And then, of course, <clears throat> you hear the president saying the direct opposite over and over and over again. Folks, this administration, more than any administration preceding it, has such a bevy of examples in which you can hear them contradicting themselves over and over and over again. And in a few days, I'm going to be putting together a show that's going to be highlighting the spectacular depth and breadth, the sheer magnitude of material that, in fact, is the Obama White House two-faced um, strategy amongst our body politic. They are the archetypes of prevarication. They, at every twist and turn, will try to untether themselves from the very standards to which they had earlier with great zeal been using as a way to win whatever election they were engaged in. This has got to stop. And we can't just say, oh, well, all politicians lie and walk away with it, because then, believe it or not, that makes their life easier. Once we start lowering our expectations when it comes to our leaders, or maybe I should say more directly, once we start lowering the expectations we have of our leaders, we, by default, knowingly begin to marginalize the quality of our own representative government, and we begin to marginalize further our own standing. We hurt ourselves. We lessen the chances of our being happier with our country to whatever extent we're willing to give latitude to politicians and their line. So I want to make this abundantly clear. The extent to which we tolerate politicians lying and 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 dodging from their original standards is the extent to which we are lowering the quality of our own lives in this country. Because if we're going to be telling them, hey, we don't expect much of you, well, then i got to ask you, how much can we expect to get from them for ourselves in the way of a healthier existence in 
these United States of America. We have right now, old friends, uh, to our program, the Talk Radio News Service for a daily news wrap-up. More specifically, uh, senior Washington correspondent and former Ohio congressman, Bob Nay. Bob, welcome back, buddy, and what have you got for us today? Thank you. Well, you know, speaking of, I guess, one would call it line of omission, the Cuban Twitter uh, scenario, which, you know, people are, are kind of having a good time chuckling about it, but actually... What they have done, and Rajiv Shaw testified before Senator Leahy's subcommittee, but the United States USAID uh, created an, an basically an offshore front company in Spain and the Cayman Islands. They hid the money trail, recruited CEOs without telling them a word that they would be uh, working only on taxpayer-funded projects is what they were told. And they created Zunzunio. And it reached 40,000 subscribers, and it was to bring down the Castro government to create a revolution. Right. And, you know, the bottom line of this thing is that they didn't tell anybody, and they didn't tell the Congress, and it's taxpayers' money. So, you know, everybody's kind of making light on it, but I, I would assume that the Appropriations Committee will just absolutely continue to rip into the entire process because, I mean, you're talking offshore. Uh, you're you're talking uh, absolute lying. I mean, it's it's criminal. Technically, while the um, endeavor may have been laudable, what's never laudable is when you go off the reservation and you put forward operations without uh, permission from the American people in the form of representative uh, government having passed uh, a, a law, which is what appropriations essentially uh, is. It's I mean, a, a, an appropriation bill is a law of, of sorts. That's right. Um, and if it hasn't been sanctioned, then essentially, again, regardless of the laudable uh, goals that may have been part and parcel of the effort, uh, you, you still have an act that's gone against the American people, yes? Yes, you do. And this one's just really outrageous when you when you look at it. I mean, they talk about Iran-Contra, et cetera, but this, is, this flies in the, the type of scenario that the Iran-Contra really fit into of, you know, shuffling money and hiding it. And then the other issue, of course, is the House Ways and Means Committee is marking up a letter to um, Attorney General Eric Holder. I don't think anything will, will happen from the Attorney General's end. But uh, the fact remains that she waived rights, made statements, then took her, you know, her rights up. And so this is not just uh, Congressman Ice's committee, uh, the Oversight Committee looking at it. This is now Ways and Means. And again, it's not the issue of did they look into groups or which groups they look into. It's the issue of did she, in fact you know, uh, commit a crime or hide material from Congress. So, Well, this I was uh, talking about this earlier. It seems like Eric Holder um, only likes to uphold laws that are violated by Republican suspects versus Democratic ones, or am I overstating it? Well, no, you're not. I mean, he was confronted today, and he leaned back in his chair, and he looked at Congressman Gomert, Gomert from Texas and said, you know, listen here, buddy, is what he said. And uh, this is over the you know 2012 contempt where you know he, he's refusing to uh, to give records, and I think they they've hit a nerve there. But when you when you look at it internally, the administration doesn't go after it, its own people when they really should. You know what? I mean, if if Eric Holder is allowed to display preferential treatment um, when it comes to those who violate the law simply because those violating the law happen to be favorable to his party. And he's only willing to enforce laws when they're violated by those from the other side. Then he's making it quite self-evident uh, that he is not to be trusted with the job he has. He is betraying the trust of the American people. And I think this piece of crap ought to remember, he doesn't work just for Obama. He works for us. God, I'd love to see this man bitch slapped. The opinions you hear on the Main Street Radio Network are those of the host, callers, and guests, and not necessarily those of the station, Main Street Radio Network, its management, or advertisers. The information on the Main Street Radio Network does not constitute a recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or securities. So please, consult a professional before investing. If you have any questions or comments about Main Street Radio Network, contact us at 703-719-0433 or at our website, MainStreetRadioNetwork.com. 